morning and welcome to online worship at Northside United Methodist Church. My name is Rachel and I am the pastor here and I am so glad to be back with you this week. I want to thank Jessica and the incredible team of musicians that led us in worship last Sunday while I was on vacation. I hope that you tuned in for that beautiful service of worship and that you were touched. This morning, we have another gift. Uh, Mr. Bill Searcy is here. He is the music director at St. Paul United Methodist Church, our partner church right down the road. And he is here this morning sharing his gifts and his talents with us. And so we hope uh, that you will enjoy all that he has to offer as we worship together this day. Just one announcement I want you to know about. If you are interested in trying out our online Bible study, we have two more weeks together on Zoom. You can even get on the Bible study on Wednesday night at 6.30 and mute yourself and turn off your camera if you just wanna listen in and see how we do things around here. If you would just leave something in the comments or direct message me or email me with my email at the end of this video, I would love to get you the Zoom link so that you can join us. This week we will be in James chapter 5 and it would be a great week to jump in with us. This morning as you are able would you join us as we sing together our opening hymn.
scripture text, we will stand in amazement with the crowds as illiterate fishermen, ragtag followers of Jesus, are given the power to perform the miracles of God. That all people might come to know and to experience the compassion and the love of Jesus. And so I want to invite you this morning to forget what you think you and instead to expect what you can't even conceive of yet. For we know and we desire to believe with our whole heart that with God, anything is possible. And so as people who believe in the seeming impossibility of what God has done and what God is doing right now, let us join together in professing what we believe. Would you join me? I believe in God who created all things and seeks for all to be in communion as God's people. I believe in Jesus Christ, who showed us how to share love and who commissioned us to go out into the highways and the byways, inviting all to be a part of God's work in the world. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who leads and guides us into the world then touches the lives of those around us in ways that make them open to receiving God's love. I believe in the harvest and God's desire for us to receive and to respond to the call to be God's laborers, sharing God's light and life with the whole wide world. Amen.
make sure that if you have children or grandchildren in your household this morning, that you go and get them if they are not in the room and bring them front and center. I have somebody that I want to introduce them to you today. You may have heard of Flat Stanley, who sometimes travels around with young kids on their adventures. And so I want to introduce you to somebody else flat today. This is Flat Jesus. That might seem like a crazy concept that I have colored and have a cut out of Jesus with me today, but I want each of you to have one of these. You'll find it at the link in your email and also in the video notes below. Because we are a church and a people who believe that Jesus goes with us wherever we find ourselves. And so especially this summer, I want to encourage you to print one of these off, to cut it out, and to color it and to take Jesus wherever you go this summer on your adventures. I want you to tag Northside United Methodist Church so we can see what you are up to, what you are doing, and all the places that you and Jesus have gone together. I plan on doing it, and I hope that some of our adults will too, and we will have such a great time sharing laughs and love and the pictures of all of the places that we have been. summer everybody we finally made it i know for you teachers and students with online learning it felt like we would never reach this point but you did and now you are in the freedom and the heat that the summer months will bring and so as our seasons and our rhythms of life change in the world we want to honor that here in our church life too and so this morning, we are starting a new sermon series to carry us throughout the summer called Get Outside. In the midst of continued coronavirus surges, particularly in our neck of the woods, we know that there are restrictions we have to follow. But one thing we can do to nourish our bodies and our souls is to get outside in the beauty of God's creation. And so throughout these summer months, we are going to be encouraging you to get outside and encounter God as each Sunday morning we explore together passages from the Gospel of Matthew in which Jesus teaches using examples from the great outdoors. This morning we are going to begin towards the end of Matthew chapter 9 in verse 35. 
If you want to follow along in your Bible, I want to give you just a second to get there. The Gospel of Matthew is about two-thirds of the way through the Bible after Zechariah and Malachi and before the Gospel of Mark. So here are these words from Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment. Give without payment. This is the word of God for us, the people of God this day. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to dig into your scriptures, to draw near to you as we know you are drawing near to us. Holy God, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to receive whatever it is that you would say to us this day. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I don't know about you, <clears throat> but I've never thought about that at a surface level much. About what it means for the harvest to be plentiful, but the laborers to be few. Instead of lingering with the subject matter at hand, my mind often wanders almost instantly to the analogy of where I assume Jesus is going to go. Because let's be honest, with Jesus, it's never about the surface level at all. But this morning, I want us to sit in the literal, not the analogy, for just a moment. I've never thought much about the harvest being plentiful and the laborers being few because I'm not a farmer. Maybe you're not either. And so because of that, our lives aren't comprised with being concerned about soil quality and hot and cold fronts, weather patterns, bugs and pests, which crop or livestock came in really well this year and which one didn't, how many workers we have versus how many we think it will take to get the job done. But there are people in this world whose very livelihood rests on those topics. In fact, if anything good has come out of this coronavirus season, maybe one of the things is that we have come to see and to notice and to hopefully have compassion for the farmers. 
the ones who make it possible for us to eat week in and week out, the ones who have been all across our television screens sharing the difficult and heart-wrenching news that they aren't sure they'll make it through this harvest season for many reasons. But one reason in particular, right at the forefront, something that I think we've heard somewhere before, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. All along the chain of the process, from the picking in the fields or the slaughtering in the houses to the processing and the packaging in the factories to the transporting to places of sale and even food banks, there aren't enough people because of working conditions and illness and travel restrictions. There aren't enough laborers to harvest the goods. And so I don't want us to read right by the image that Jesus uses to establish his point this morning as if it is a tool that we could never relate to. Instead, I want us to pause and to hear in Jesus' voice the tremble of one of those desperate farmers that we have witnessed during this coronavirus season, who can see that he is getting ready to lose his livelihood, what he's built his life on, and all that he's worked so hard to establish and cherish. I want us to see in his eyes the desire with which he wants to do something to make the outcome different, but he needs others to come alongside him and work for him with no credit of their own, but merely because there's something so sincere in the way that Jesus states the current climate that they desire for the outcome to be different too. I want us to feel it in our core, inspired to want to perform some kind of action, even if we can't fully understand what it is yet, simply because Jesus, the farmer, seems so heavily invested and committed and moved by what is going on. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, they're few. Prior to this statement, Jesus has been traveling throughout the cities and the villages, teaching and proclaiming the good news, curing diseases and illnesses. What he has been able to do has been simply incredible. The word is beginning to get out about him and folks are flocking to wherever they think he might go next, following him around until they can get their moment in his immediate presence to be seen and known and cherished by him. But I don't think Jesus is performing these miraculous actions simply because he knows he can do them. I don't think Jesus is doing them out of obligation because he knows it's what he's supposed to do. The text tells us that Jesus, in these moments in time, before doing anything else, he just takes a minute to behold the crowd that has come. To focus on each of them, to take in the picture of it all. And he notices that they're hurting, that they're harassed, that they are helpless. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus can't help but be moved with compassion. Compassion 
that word that indicates that deep in his gut he feels for their situations and he is moved into action doing all that he can to be kind and cherish each of them like the child of God that they are. But the harvest is plentiful and the workers they're few. Jesus, he knows that there are too many of them that desire his presence. And so instead of just throwing up his hands and saying, well, it's too much, let's just go on home. Instead, he asks his disciples to pray that other laborers might be sent out. And then he turns around and he sends the disciples the answer to their own prayers. The disciples, people who have witnessed the pain of the people and might be moved to compassion to meet the people's troubling needs. And I don't want it to be lost on us that the list with which Jesus commissions the disciples of what they are charged to go and do in chapter 10, verse 1, and again in verses 7 and 8, the list with which Jesus commissions their work is the same list of actions of what he himself has been doing all along. Go and cast out the unclean spirits. Go and cure the sick. Raise the dead. And proclaim to every single person that you meet that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. They and we literally become the extension of Jesus's presence, living as he lived, doing what he did, proclaiming the kingdom that he brought. People who are looking out over the plentiful harvest completely overwhelmed like that trembling farmer that isn't true the work will get done and yet being moved with compassion to jump in and just do what we can of making sure that people's needs are met. Fulfilling people's desire to be known and loved as a child of God. Establishing in concrete measures that what we say with our lips has come true. The kingdom of heaven is near. Friends, we get to be like Farmer Jesus. But only if we open our eyes to those who are hurting. And don't just notice them, but are moved with compassion to act. Author Austin Channing Brown, in her powerful book, I'm Still Here, tells the story of an educational field trip that she went on in college. And I want you to hear her story about being moved to action in her own words. Not that long ago, in the spring of my freshman year of college, my roommate invited me on a trip a three-day journey down south exploring black history in partnership with another student. There were about 20 pairs of us, mostly comprised of one black and one white student. And we traveled all night from Chicago to Louisiana, arriving at our first stop, a plantation. Now, we had come prepared to witness the harsh realities of slavery, but the real revelation was how self-congratulatory our guides from the plantation could be. 
For the entire tour, we were told about happy slaves who sang in the fields, who worked under better conditions than most other slaves, and whose fingers never bled despite the massive amounts of cotton that they picked. The guide's presentations were filled with misconceptions and inaccuracies, and at the conclusion of the tour, they gave us the chance to pick cotton on our own. Black students picking cotton. The anger of the black students and the confusion of the white students was palpable as we climbed back aboard the bus to roll on to our next destination. We took turns speaking into the microphone at the front of the bus. The black students were livid at the romanticism displayed at the plantation. The white students listened politely, but they seemed unmoved. The tour had driven a wedge in our group. And our next stop would drive the wedge even deeper. Our bus pulled into a museum consisting of only one exhibit, a history of lynching. Every wall was filled with photographs of dark-skinned human beings swinging by their necks. A mother and a son hanging over a bridge, burned bodies, white children staring in wide-eyed wonder while their parents proudly pointed and looked on. We came across newspaper stories that advertised lynchings as community events. And in another case, we saw a postcard. On the front was a photo of a mutilated man. On the other side, a handwritten note. We missed you at the barbecue. There was no sound as we walked through the exhibit. We could barely breathe, let alone speak. We climbed back on the bus. All that could be heard were sniffles. The emotion was thick. It was as if no time had passed between the generation in those pictures and the ones sitting on that bus. The first student to break the silence was white. I didn't even know this happened. It's not my fault. I wasn't there. They reached for anything that would distance themselves from the pain and the anger of the moment. Anything to ward off guilt and shame, shock, and devastation. But the black students, we shared personal stories of pain. Lynchings that had happened in our own families. And we tried to make real the bodies from those photographs. The tension climbed black and white grew further and further apart with each new speaker. The white students defended their family histories as the black students searched for the words to express how it felt to look at our people's bodies in those photos. But then as we pulled into the parking lot to break for lunch, another white student stood to speak. But instead of a different variation on, please don't make me responsible for this, she took a deep breath and gave in to her emotion. I don't know what to do with what I've learned. She said, I can't fix your pain, and I surely can't take it away. But I can see it. And I can work for the rest of my life to make sure your children never know the pain of racism. And then she said nine words that I have never forgotten. Doing nothing is no longer an option for me. Those words changed the air on that bus. 
She acknowledged the depth of our pain without making excuses for it, and she was moved to action. And in that moment, I knew her words were true for me as well. Doing nothing was no longer an option for me. Friends, we are called by Jesus to the powerful work of being the extension of his presence. To not only notice the pain of this world, but to be moved with compassion to act in a way that begins to alleviate it. That the world might begin to see and to encounter that surely God's kingdom is near. Doing nothing is no longer an option. Will you labor that the kingdom might come near? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join me as we pray together this day? Gracious and holy God, the one who created every single one of us, who looked us straight in the eyes and told us that we were good. We come before you this morning wanting to be people who cherish that in every single person that we meet. God, we want your kingdom to be brought near. And so we ask, oh God, this day that you would forgive us for all of the ways that we have sheltered your kingdom for the ways that we have stood in the way of people seeing your grace and your goodness and your love. We ask that you would forgive us and that you would send us out with that charge that you sent your disciples out with long, long ago to give us the power to be your hands and your feet on this earth, to be the very extension of your presence. What an incredible call and a mighty gift. God, we thank you for all of the many ways that you have touched our own lives, for the ways that our stories are rich with your handprint all over them. We pray that you would make us brave to share whatever it is that you have done in our lives that this world might continue to be changed and changed into what you intend for it to be, so that the kingdom might come. Holy God, we pray for every single person in our church community and in the wider neighborhood and in the city of Greenville this day that is hurting. And we pray that we might not only notice their pain, but that we might come alongside them and work with all of our power and our might to alleviate it. God, we know that you are with us wherever we go and through whatever we face. And so we pray this day for an extra helping of your spirit and your presence with us. That no matter where you call us, no matter what surprises are in store, no matter how far out of our comfort zones we have to go to meet the needs of this world, that we would trust and we would know that you are already there and that you are our companion, equipping us for whatever is required in your name. Holy God, we thank you this day for your power and your love and your grace. 
And we hope that we might be beacons of that light each and every day. Out of that gratitude with which we come before you this morning, we pray earnestly the prayer with which your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. a church here at Northside have a mission statement that is very near and dear to our hearts. We believe that we are called to love God, to love one another, and to love the north side of Greenville. And so I hope that wherever you find yourself this morning, that that would be your call, that you would not only see the pain that is in this world, that you would go to where that is, that you would be moved by compassion to do something, to begin to alleviate that pain on another's behalf. If you ever need resources or a place to talk or to bounce off ideas, my door is always open to you. May we be people who are brave and who are helping to bring the kingdom of God very near. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.